Amen. I couldn't declare it any better. That's what we're here for this morning, to declare in the name of Jesus Christ, we're clean from everything that we've done. If you're visiting with us today, that's, that's reason enough for you to be here, to come back and find out how you can be made clean through Jesus Christ. Welcome, Eastview family. Glad you guys are here. Did you enjoy the snow this week? And the Winter Olympics started. How many of you guys scored at least an 8.5 on an epic fall in the snow or the ice this week? I had at least one that would have been amazing to see on, on, the, on the screen. But anyway, uh, glad nobody was filming that. I want, to, I want to invite you all, if you're here as a visitor or you're new uh, to Jesus Christ, you want to get plugged in, text hello to that number on the screen anytime during our services. Those watching online today, we're so glad that you're uh, here. I got several shout outs. Number one, I got to say to our building services and volunteers for clearing our parking lots. Amazing, amazing work. This week, thank you guys so much for doing that. We we'll say hi to Patty and Jim in Longboat Key, uh, Florida, with Steve and Janet. Man, that sounds like an awesome place. Don't you don't have to invite me ever, uh, but maybe uh, Chuck from Austin, Texas, uh, the Tox in Dwight, and Dan and Janice in Georgia. God bless you all and everybody watching us online. I want to give a shout out to Coach Dave Witzig. He was named to the Illinois Coaches Basketball Hall of Fame this week. He's one of our own coaches in normal high school, so. Congratulations, Dave. God bless you with that. Uh, and, and one other thing, next week, y'all got to come. Y'all just got to come live next week. We're giving away free t-shirts. Woo! But more than that, but more than that, this is going to be one of the most incredible vision Sundays we've had in a long, long time. And I hope that you'll come and see what we believe God's getting ready to do at Eastview Christian Church. Well, we're going to be in Mark chapter 14 today. If you have your Bibles, it's a long chapter. And uh, we're going to start with verse 66 today. As we look at another failure of, of, of the Apostle Peter, and I, I want to ask this question as we get started. Have you ever tried to distance yourself from someone? Have you ever tried to, I mean, maybe they're a friend, maybe a family member, maybe an acquaintance, but for whatever reason you're going, I'm not with them, don't put me with them. I got a couple of personal ones um, today that I can share. One of these memories happened with some of my longtime friends who are sitting over here in the front row, Al and Stephanie Shiflett. They've been in our small group forever, and they're great friends. We've journeyed a long way together. Is it okay if I tell this story? Okay, too late now. Uh, but back in the day, like 22 years ago, uh, we were coaching, and our kids were playing Little League football. Now, you won't, this story will not make sense because you know how sweet and loving my wife is, but there's something happens to moms when, when little boys start knocking each other around and hitting each other, the craziness comes out. So it was on one of those occasions, Al and I had coached the, the, the division before us, and, and now our, our kids were playing, and Mikey was out on the field uh, playing, and um, it was just a bad organization. It was not uh, you know, it was not well run. The coaching was not great. And I was a part of that. Uh, and uh, and uh, it was just one of those games where it was getting out of control. And nobody seemed to have control of the game. And my wife starts shouting from the little bleachers on the side, get Mikey off the field. Get him off the field. And I'm just sitting there going, Mikey needs to, you know, toughen up a little bit. So you just stay out there in the field. And she keeps yelling, get him off the field. Get him out of there. Get, he should, you know, this is terrible. And, uh, you know, Sarah, she's not shy, but she was really passionate and uh, yelling it out. And then somebody uh, comes up to Al and says, man, what's up with your wife? And Al goes, that's not my wife. <laughs> it's really easy to disown someone in the right moment. Another moment of disowning came for me at the United Center with a longtime co-staff and friends, Mark and Rachel Warren. Somebody had given us tickets to go to the United Center, see the Bulls play my beloved Indiana Pacers. And, uh, and so we went together, and we had VIP parking and everything, and I, of course, wore all of my Indiana Pacers gear, right, to the Chicago Bulls United Center. You guys are going, if you're from around here, you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but that's just the kind of guy that I am. But though my team lost, I trash-talked with all the Bulls fans around me the entire time, because I'm from Indianapolis, that's what you do. My game in my mouth is better than my game on the court, so... Uh, that's kind of a thing. Now, if you don't know this, Chicago fans can be quite eloquent after a few beers. <laughs> very, very vocal. And it was brutal. And, and, and at one point, I actually, I actually calmed down because I looked over and, and Rachel was kind of freaking out a little bit. After the game, the Bulls win. Everybody's happy there. It's crowded exit. You know how it is. People giving me farewell greetings. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I put my arm around Rachel. I said, wasn't that a blast? At which point she took my arm from around her shoulders and said something like, Mike, I'm not with you. 
And, uh, and so our friendship right there, we understood. And, and today we come to the famous story of Peter in Mark chapter 14, where Peter says of Jesus, that's not my Lord, and I'm not with him. And he distances himself with the relationship with Jesus Christ. And again, what we hope and what we're praying is, as we come to this story of following in the Bible, that we can learn about our following Jesus, you know, 2,000 years later. So if you would, let's just ask the Lord to speak to us, even as we begin to read this morning, Mark chapter 14, verse 66. As Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today. God, um, I pray that you would move now as only you can by the power of your Holy Spirit and the preached word Jesus and the written word the Bible and that you would just touch every heart. It's that simple, Lord. That's my prayer that believer, unbeliever, longtime follower, brand new follower, every one of us, even I as I preach, that I would just hear from your Holy Spirit that I would be convicted and changed and renewed in this moment. God, we've just sung that you clean us, and that is the story. You clean all of us. You have cleaned me. You've cleaned this congregation, and you've done it again and again. And so if there's someone outside of you today or someone here who feels unclean, would you draw them to your son, Jesus? Would you draw them in so that he can clean them as he's cleaned us? And we ask all this, Lord. It's a, it's a big order, but... You're God, and you can do it. So I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to end this series called Failing Fearlessly. We started the year off with a bang, talking about our, our failures and how we can still be fearless followers in the midst of it. And in case you're new to Eastview, fearless following is a part of our vision statement. So you hear that a lot around here. But how can we fearlessly follow even in the midst of our failures? That's what this story is about. And we've looked at all the fails of the Apostle Peter during the, uh, as recorded in the book of Mark. And if you're visiting or you're new to Eastview or following Jesus or you're not yet a follower, maybe you're watching online for the first time, you might think this is a guilt trip series. That we started off the year going, okay, you guys, you're all a bunch of losers. You've denied Christ. You've betrayed Christ. You've failed Christ. Get your act together. Try better. Do better. Make 2022 uh, the year that you are better. That's not what this, this series is about. This series is about acknowledging our failures and asking if Jesus will change us and grow us as we fail and we come back to him again and again. So let's, let's just get into the, the word today. I want to set the context for the story that I just read. I want to show you where we're at today. This again is the, the diagram of the first century uh, Jerusalem. And, uh, and somewhere in here is Caiaphas' house. This is a first century rendering. I've actually been to Caiaphas' house, but it's somewhere in there. It's in the upper part of the city, which is the rich uh, place, place where rich people live. And, um, and here's the thing. You might say, well, how do we know that this is Caiaphas' house? And I've actually asked a lot of uh, tour guides, do we know? They're like, this is pretty scientifically archaeological sound location. And one thing we know about this is that this had a large courtyard and it had a large room where they could assemble the Sanhedrin, 71 people, right? It also has prison cells underneath the current house today where we believe they kept Jesus in between all the trials. So uh, this, is, this is a really cool opportunity when we go to the Holy Land to go, yeah, Caiaphas' house is here. I'll show you something else in just a minute. You see these streets that kind of run up here. These, they're steps, actually, that come down from the Kidron Valley and through the gates. And so I want to show you these steps now. These are first century steps. They're remains from the first century, steps that led from Caiaphas' house down into the Kidron Valley. Here's another shot right here. You can just see it going down into the valley. That's very, very likely, almost 100% sure, Jesus was led up and down these steps. And then finally, I want to show you the courtyard. 
This is the courtyard. Sorry for the blurriness. This is circa, you know, iPhone like three or something, right? Uh, but uh, it, this is a picture. Right to the right are the ruins, and now there's a church over the top of Caiaphas's house. This is the courtyard where all of this action takes place, where Peter denies Jesus Christ. And I want to start here because I think we find ourselves uh, with a lot in common. Christ followers find ourselves in the courtyard of unbelief. That's, that's where we start the story. We're surrounded by people who don't believe in Jesus Christ, that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who maybe even don't like Jesus or are anti-Jesus. Now, I've got the scriptures there for you, Matthew 26 and Luke 22 and John 18. Those are the other gospels renditions of the same story, the denial of, of Jesus by Peter. So I want you to look at those, but I'll be using some of those details to kind of figure out who exactly is in this courtyard of unbelief. Well, first of all, we have the star of the story. Number one, this unnamed little girl, one of the servant girls. I call her a little girl because the Greek word indicates there in verse 66, servant girl is a word for a younger girl. Maybe she's 10 or 11 or 12 years old and she is a high priest servant. We don't know what she does. Does she do the dishes? Does she bid, uh, bring stuff to him? We don't know, but she's one of the servant girls and she's serving in the house of Jesus' avowed enemy, Caiaphas. So obviously she's not pro-Jesus or pro-Peter or any of the followers of Jesus. We also find here, according to John 18, 18, servants and officers, they're the ones who are making the charcoal fire. So put this whole story together. We were in the garden. Some officers arrested Jesus. They've brought him to the courtyard. Now he's in their charge. They're making a fire out in the courtyard. There's a little servant girl. There are other servant girl, girls there. Now listen to this. This is the crazy thing. I don't know how Peter thought he could ever get away with being recognized. But in chapter 18 of John, uh, verse 15, um, we, we find out that the, the man whose ear Peter had cut off, one of his relatives was there. So it's probably the story is spread a lot through the place. I'm sorry, I said John 18, uh, 15, it's 18, 26. The only other Christian in this courtyard is John the Apostle. He kind of alludes to himself being there in John 18, 15. So I just want to stop here at the beginning of the story because before we say, man, Peter really messed things up, let's just acknowledge this. At least he's here. At least he's here. He's in the neighborhood. You know, there's one surefire way he would not have denied Jesus on this night. He wouldn't have had to be in the courtyard. At least the Bible says that he followed at a distance, which is a metaphor for how some of us follow. But at least he was there. At least he was trying to figure out what was going on. He's as close to Jesus as he dares get. It's a risky place. Jesus is under arrest. He could be under arrest. Jesus is going to die. He could die. So let's just acknowledge for just a moment that he's there which is more than probably I or some of you would have done. But in fact, it's this association with, and his place being close to Jesus that makes this servant girl recognize him. Would you see this? The, the servant girls, one of the servant girls of the high priest, came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him. And, and this word in the Greek language to look means to, to gaze at, to stare. She probably did like, well, like what we call a double take. She, she was just going, no way. And she's looking at him because he's warming himself by the fire. It's dark and it's cold, but there's a glow on his face. And she's going, that guy looks really familiar. And, and she recognizes him. There's a question for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Does, do the people in your courtyard of unbelief, do they recognize you as a follower of Jesus Christ? Do they, what she accuses him of, you have been with Jesus. You also were with the Nazarene. Do the people on your team the people you coach, the people you play with, the people you work out with, the people you go to school with, the people in your neighborhood, the people you shop with every week. Isn't it funny how we always end up like in the same lanes and traffic going to the same places week after week? Do they know? Is there any evidence if they studied you, if they watched your life, would they say to you, you also are with Jesus? It's a great question. You're going to have to write that sermon. That's not even the main point. But here's the deal. Do they recognize you? One of the things for sure is they recognize Peter. She recognized him by his face that he had been associated with Jesus. There's another dead giveaway with Peter. And this is kind of a, a, a funny thing. We talked about this in the planning uh, time with our sermon planning team this week and, and preaching team. And, uh, and we said, even in this setting, Peter couldn't keep his mouth shut. He, just, he just couldn't be quiet because you know what gave him away? One of the things that gave him away was his accent. He talks differently. 
Now, you don't know this because we don't live uh, 2,000 years ago, but I've studied and I've understood that the people from Jerusalem and Judah in the southern part of Israel spoke totally differently than the uneducated and less cultured class in the northern part of Galilee, okay? Just think of the difference between a Brooklyn native stopping for gas in a small southern mountain town. You ain't from these parts, Right? That's how it goes. And Peter is the same way. You notice in this passage, they mention Jesus the Nazarene. Where's that? Nazareth is a small little town up in Galilee. And then they say, you were with the Galilean. You are Galilean. Verse 70. So in Matthew, one of the, uh, one of the accounts, Matthew says, your accent gives you away. So Peter's just yucking it up, talking, you know, can't keep his mouth shut, even though Jesus is on trial. Maybe he's probably just sitting there going, y'all, it's downright cold out here tonight. Warming his hands, they're looking at him like, dude, who let the Galilean in? It's so obvious. It's so clear to them. His accent has given him away. Here's another question. You have to write your own sermon. Holy Spirit, do this in our lives. Does your accent give you away? When you're in culture, when you're in school, when you're with your your people, when you're with the people you hang out with socially, when you go to work, do those in your respective courtyards, do our respective courtyards, do they know we're a Christian by the way we talk? by the way that we relate stories, by the grace that we give or don't give with the words that come out of our mouth. See, it's one thing to look like a Christ follower, which Peter does because he's recognized as being with Jesus. It's another thing to sound like one and for people to identify us as followers of Jesus Christ because of the way we sound. Well, I'm going to get to this in just a moment, but I want to go ahead and and, and set the stage for where we're going to go. There are three Christ-following denials Guys, um, the reality is if we show ourselves to be Christ followers by the way we live and we speak in a way that makes other people go, oh, your accent gives you away, you're a Christ follower, sooner or later, we're going to have to talk about it. They're going to ask us questions. In fact, what we're going to start praying about next week is for people to ask us questions so we can give a testimony about Jesus Christ. But before we get to these three denials, I want to ask this question. Why did Peter deny Jesus? Why? Why? He did it because of fear. He he was afraid. Jesus has been arrested. Everything he thought about Messiah is blown up right now. Jesus is arrested. Jesus has said for months and years, I'm going to go and die at the hands of these officials. Peter is apparently in this moment, the bravado of the garden slicing ears has turned into, I'm afraid of this little girl. What happened? Well, now it's real. Now, it's going to cost him something. At some point, every Christ follower, you and I, no one's exception, every Christ follower is eventually going to find out that it costs something to align themselves with Jesus. You cannot be incognito with Jesus very long. Sooner or later, it's going to cost you something. Probably not your life. Maybe something as crazy as your job. Maybe a relationship. Maybe status. Maybe a title. Maybe a friendship circle that you want to be a part of. Could be popularity. I don't know what it is, but I know this. Sooner or later, if we look like we follow Jesus and we talk like we follow Jesus, we're going to have to say, I follow Jesus, whatever it costs. So let's look at the ways that Peter um, was denying Jesus. Of course, Peter said it literally three times. I don't know him. I'm denying that I know him. But I see in this story some subtle movements and ways that you and I sometimes deny Jesus. First of all, we deny Jesus with our silence. It's subtle here, but as I started studying this passage this week, it's like, Peter's just trying to blend in. He just wants to be one of the guys in the courtyard, warming himself at the fire, just like everyone else. He doesn't want anyone to notice him. He's close enough to Jesus, but he doesn't want to be identified. It's too risky. So he gathers around the fire, warming himself just like everyone else on this cold night, hoping that he can get an idea of what's going on with Jesus. Guys, often our first denial of Christ as 21st century Americans is just trying to blend in. I'm convinced, and I know many of you, we've traveled uh, 26 years together. Many of you, I know that you don't go to work intentionally going, if they ask me, I'm going to say, no, Jesus. Or you don't go to school going, I'm going to deny him if anybody says anything. But we actually don't want them to ask the question. We want to blend in. And so we blend in with the way we talk. We blend in with the way that we dress. We blend in with the kind of movies that we binge watch. We blend in in a million ways. And 
And, and we're like Peter. When the question's asked, we're just like, uh, 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 uh. actually, this is a double uh, Greek word here. He's, he just trying to answer the question, but not answer the question. I don't know or understand. Uh. He's just trying to play it off. Like, I, I, want you to under, I, I want you to think that I just didn't really hear the question. And sometimes I think we're that way. Have you ever been silent when someone asks you about your Christianity in an, in an outlier kind of way? Like when somebody says to you, man, you are really being incredibly courageous going through this cancer or the death of a loved one or through this hard period financially for your business. How are you surviving? That's an open door for you to say, Jesus. But how many times we go, oh, you know, I'm just getting along, hanging in there. How many times has, uh, have you heard maybe somebody criticize the church? The church is full of hypocrites. And you just go, hmm, I don't know or understand what you say. Huh? Huh? Start talking about sports or something else. Or somebody might say, who believes in the Bible? It's just a bunch of myths. And you're just silent. It's not really saying, I don't believe in Jesus, but we're denying the power of Christ and his name in the middle of that. Glad we have all day Sunday to do nothing. And uh, you, you don't say, well, I'm, I'm going to church. You can come with me, actually. I love it when I go um, sometimes on Sundays, 6 o'clock when Starbucks opens, I'm in, in the drive through window. And, and often while they're fixing my drink, they're like, what are you doing today? What plans you got today? And uh, it would be real easy to go, ah, not much. But I usually say something like, I'm preaching four times. Or I'm going to go hang out with a thousand people at a party. You want to come? Yeah, yeah. Are you silent? Because I believe sometimes we just, in a, in a really subtle way, we deny Jesus through our silence. And Peter, if he didn't have a chance to answer the question, he would have just been in that courtyard, not said a word, snuck out to wherever he was going, and he would have been cool. But he was silent. Now, Peter makes another move that, that I see for us sometimes called separation. Do you notice what happens? Um, one of the commentators that I read this week about this passage said, the heat of the charcoal fire literally is too hot for him. He's got to get away from it. And he moves. Did you see it in verse 68? He moves to the gateway. I'm cold and I want to be warmed up, but now the people are recognizing me. He went out into the gateway and the rooster crowed. Should have been a warning sign. He should have just kept going at that point. But he moves to the gateway, maybe trying to get lost in the shadows. And I think it's a great picture of us sometimes separating ourselves from Jesus. Guys, we live in a culture increasingly, you know this, we live in a culture increasingly where it's not popular to be a churchgoer. It's not, it's, it, people don't pat you on the back and go, oh, you're a Christian? 40 or 50 years ago, be like, oh yeah, what church you go to? I'm a Christian too. But it's more and more all the time the, what's called the rise of the nuns in the, in, the, in the polls that ask people, what religious affiliation do you have? It's like 30 or 40% say none. So it's not like, like where you lead with, I'm a Christian, I'm going to church, I read the Bible, I follow Jesus. People aren't clapping for you. And it's really easy to separate ourselves from that. Even in this town, it's not always easy to associate with Eastview because of stances and beliefs that we have preached and, and proclaim here. I said this last week, if you preach the truth and follow Jesus exclusively as the only way to God and follow the Bible completely as the authority of God, you're not going to win very many popularity polls. But I think many of us just want to kind of separate ourselves from being identified with Jesus or his church or the people who go to church. Guys, listen, here's the deal. You're eventually going to have to admit that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, we got challenged, I think my sophomore year or whatever, and I was planning on being a preacher at that time, and we got challenged to start carrying our Bibles to, to, to school. And I took the challenge. I was never so scared in my life. First of all, I was a sophomore. I didn't know all the answers, and people think you do when you carry your Bible. Second of all, it really, it really makes you stand out <laughs> when you're walking through high school hallways with a Bible. And I just, I just feel like it's every once in a while we're going to have to attach ourselves. We're not going to have to stand in the shadows. We're going to have to come out of the shadows where people may or may not know whether we're Christians or not. And we're going to have to be bold in the way that we approach them for Jesus Christ. 
Guys, here's the deal. I don't know what Peter exactly was afraid of here. I think it was uh, being killed. I think it was being arrested, being attached with Jesus. But I don't think he was ashamed of Jesus himself. And I want to encourage you with this today because there's a great scripture that we have um, from Romans 1.16 that says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I want to give you this as a word of encouragement. Wherever you work, wherever you go to school, wherever you live, it's not shame in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to save the world from their sins. It's gospel. It's good news. When you shirk back into, uh, shrink back into the shadows and when you deny Jesus, you know what you're doing? You're, you're, you're giving people uh, an eternal condemnation because you're not sharing good news. Guys, here's what we have. There's a way out. There's a way out of your sin. There's a way out of your past. There's a way out of the pain in your life. You can be saved. We're not ashamed of that. And once that sh- the, the lack of shame over the message become stronger than the shame of what we're going to lose if we attach ourselves to Jesus, then then maybe we'll get back to owning him and not denying him. Well, there's still one last S word we got to fill in today, and that's the word sin. Of course, when you deny Jesus three times, that's sin, because there's nothing more, you know, sinful than saying, hey, you're my Lord and Savior. No, you're not. But this is really where it gets incredible. Uh, Peter just blatantly sins here in verse 71. Did you see it? By the way, Luke, in Luke 22, he says, this happened about an hour after the second denial. So uh, you're worth one of them. Uh, I did, uh, no, no, no. Uh, no, you, you really are one of them. No, I don't know the man. Now it gets crazy because now the crowds, now he's overwhelmed, not just by the little servant girl. The people are noticing him and they're looking at him and they're saying, you certainly are with him. You're Galilean. Look what it says in verse 71. He began to invoke a curse on himself. The the Greek word is the word anathema. You've heard of it probably before if you've been around Bible studies very long. If you're new, it doesn't matter. The word's anathema. But it means to call a curse. It would be like me saying, may God strike me dead and send me to hell. I do not know this man. Now that's a long, long way from you are the Christ, the son of God. But it's only about two chapters in your Bible. You are the Christ, the son of God. To may God strike me dead and send me to hell. I don't know who he is. And it's it's intense. There's just no way to get past this. Peter, because of how bold he is and how strong language he is, this gets him in trouble because he couldn't have said any stronger, I don't know who he is. They couldn't be more opposite statements. Jesus Christ is Lord, and I do not know who he is. And we all look at Peter in this moment, and we think, what is going on, Peter? Why would you say such a thing? Why would you act in this way? Why wouldn't you stand up and have some guts for Jesus? And yet all of us who follow Jesus at one time made the same profession. We call it the good confession because if you come to faith in Christ here, we say, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? And do you take him as your Lord and Savior? And if you're here and you've been a part of Eastview, that's what we ask you before you're baptized and then you've been baptized into him by faith. And uh, so all of us in here, probably many of us have made this confession. And yet, and yet it's really easy for our lives not to reflect that confession. Jesus is Lord. He's the Christ, the Son of God. But sometimes in my action, I join in the gossip, or I judge other people, or I hold prejudice in my heart, or... I look at sinful images of sex and movies and media and everything that's all around us, or I tell them proper jokes. Or it's any number of ways. Guys, here's, here's the point. The point is, we may not shout, God, curse me and die. But we do call the curse of sin upon ourselves because we're going, you know what? Here, Jesus is Lord, but I'm going to go back to cursed living. And that's our reality. Brothers and sisters, to confess Jesus Christ is Lord and yet live lives of sin is a denial that Jesus is Lord. Most of us in here have never, ever said, I don't believe in Jesus. Even the most skeptic people, yeah, I believe he's a guy. I say this all the time, uh, atheists don't believe in God, I don't believe in atheists. Down deep, I think everybody knows. 
The question, though, is how are we going to live differently? Remember, I started this sermon series and this sermon today by saying this series and this sermon is not designed to make you walk out those back doors going, yeah, I confess him as Lord and I deny him just like Peter. What a jerk. What a loser I am. That's not the point of this series. The point of this series and the point of this sermon is that our failure as Christ followers is not the end of the story. Is that great? Look at verse 72. It ends so anticlimactically. It ends in such a bad way. In fact, according to the Gospel of Mark, this is the last time you hear Peter's name. Story over. History is bad. He, the last thing he did was deny Jesus Christ. And then he's crying. We thought about this this week. We were in the, um, the preaching team meeting. Wouldn't it be great if we had a, a rooster to snap his back into shape every time we just denied Jesus Christ? I'm afraid my life would sound like a barnyard most of the time. But wouldn't it be great if you just had a warning every once in a while? Hey, hey, you're denying Jesus. Cockle-doodle-doo, right? <laughs> it's my best. I can do better, but I'm not going to try. Yeah. Come back to the 11, maybe I'll do an impression of a rooster. But wouldn't it be great if we had a reminder that we've denied Christ, that we have fallen away from ownership and partnership with him? Well, we do have that. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The word of God reminds you. The gathering of the saints encourages you. Every week we come in here, this is the reason I think church is so important and you should be here every Sunday, never miss a Sunday. Why? This is our weekly rooster crow to remind us that out there is not real and here is. This is where we find it. This is our wake-up call. And there are three things that happen quickly here as we close in the sermon that happened to Peter. Number one, he remembers one of the things that happens when we gather, we just did it before the sermon, we celebrate the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Why? To remember. Don't ever forget we sing songs like clean. Why? So we remember. He's made us clean. Jesus told Peter that this is what was going to happen. And he remembered the words of the Lord. Rooster's going to crow twice, but you'll deny me three times before it does. Number two is be broken. Remember what Jesus has said and everything about all of his words. Be broken. See, once we've remembered and we're confronted with our sin, we have to, we have to do something with it. This is a simple question. When's the last time you cried because you were sorry for your sin? When's the last time? You, you sit there and you, you look at Peter like, well, of course he cried. He's a total jerk in the courtyard and denied Jesus. Yeah, so am I. Every time I sin. It's no less heartbreaking to Jesus for me to sin than for Peter to say, I don't know this man. When's the last time you and I cried over our sin? Not because we got caught, not because our mom is telling our, us to tell our sister we're sorry, not because we're trying to impress God and we're ashamed of ourselves, not because we're trying to impress other people. You just know that you've sinned against your best friend and you're sorry and you cry. When's the last time? Because I think that sorrow is important. Mourning over our sin is important. In fact, here's what Paul writes to the Corinthians in the second letter of Corinthians 7.10. Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regrets, whereas worldly grief produces death. We know the difference between Judas and Peter? Judas had a worldly grief that had no hope. He walked away. He hung himself, had eternal condemnation. Peter, he, he, he repented. He was so sorry for his sin. He said, I, I got to get right. See, the good news of this denial and all of our following fails is that our stories don't end in verse 72. Wherever you're at right now, whatever's going on in your world, however broken you are, however sinful you are, however ashamed of yourself you are, no matter who you are right now, you're, that's verse 72. And if we concluded Peter's story of verse 72, what a terrible story. But his story doesn't end there, and your story doesn't end where you're at right now. Jesus prayed for him to turn again, and he did. And what's true for the first Christ followers is true for us. No matter how far you may feel from God right now, you can always run back to him. Verse 72 is never the end. You can always return to Jesus. He's always willing to forgive you if you confess your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You see this verse? You, godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation with no regrets. 
I've sinned more than you can possibly imagine. I don't regret them because he's taken them away. And many of you know that truth as well. Peter has failed. Peter does seem hopeless. But Peter was broken. But you know the story. A little more than 48 hours over a three-day period, something happened that would change his life forever and change our lives forever as well. In terms of the biblical record, we lose track of Peter as his triple denier after his triple denial in the courtyard. But in John's eyewitness account, we catch up with Peter again. Early on a Sunday morning. He's not crying. He's running. He's running to a grave. The grave of Jesus where they had laid his body on Friday. And now reports are it's empty. And he's running. Hoping and praying. You can get a second chance. And this is how every one of our Christ following stories go. The story doesn't end in the courtyard of our failures, but at the empty tomb of Jesus. And that's it. And so when we fail, we run again and again and again to the grave and find the redemption and the life that only God can give us there. You know, um, Maybe a few months later, Peter walks right back into this courtyard. This time, he's under arrest. And this time, the high priest is questioning him and saying, you deny Jesus, deny his resurrection, deny everything you've been preaching to these people. And Peter says he can't, because there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. As far as we know, Peter would never deny Jesus again. May we be followers like him. You come back again and again and again to his grace as he creates us fearless followers. Amen.